Okay. I, uh, I'm going out on a limb talking about good and evil, right and wrong, whether they're objective or not. Yes, it's very controversial, and yes, it's been discussed for thousands of years, and yes, there are hundreds of books, some of which are really good, and it's very controversial. But my hope tonight is to make room for a view that's unpopular. But make room, I mean, to explain why it isn't just to be waved away and dismissed, why it isn't obviously incorrect, even though it's politically incorrect. I'm going to explain what can be said in favor of morality being objective. And again, uh, we could discuss this for a year, uh, so I'm not, complaining, I'm not claiming to settle the issue. I just want to raise some considerations that should count in favor. Now, I'm going to run this shear according to a certain plan. I'm not going to take the time tonight to justify the plan. If it isn't obvious to you why I'm doing it this way, perhaps on another occasion I'll talk about the methodology. But here's the way I'm going to do it. One way to discuss any topic well, let me start, I'm sorry, let me start at the beginning. Uh, anyone who claims to know that something is true owes a reason. No views come free. There's no default position. If nobody knew anything, and nobody said anything, then we start off that this is right. And then other people have to wake an uphill battle to show that it's not right. That's nonsense. There are three possible attitudes towards a proposition. One is to believe that it's true, one is to believe that it's false, and one is to confess ignorance. I don't know whether it's true or false. All three are perfectly appropriate, different people at different times. If you say it's true, you ought to have good reason for thinking it's true. If you say it's false, you ought to have good reason for thinking that it's false. If you don't have good reason on either side, then you should just be honest and say, I don't know. Could be true, could be false, I just don't know, because I haven't got good reasons either way. So a person who says that morality is objective, Real, factual, true and false, owes us a reason for thinking it's objective. A person who says that it's not objective, not true and false, not valid or invalid, no standards, owes us a good reason for thinking there are no standards. A person who has no standards for its being objective and no standards for its being without an objective, uh, no evidence, I should say. There's no evidence, no reason for its being objective, no reason for its being relative or subjective, should simply say, I don't know. I'm stressing this because there's a whole bevy of people out there who say, if you believe it's objective, show it. And if you fail to show it, then it's not objective. That's wrong, capital W. If he fails to show that it's objective, then, surprise, surprise, He's failed to show that it's objective, period. And so far, you don't know that it's objective. It might be. He might just not have found the right way to show it. You certainly shouldn't conclude that it's not objective. Just conclude what you've been shown, that he failed to show that it's objective. So end of story, and say for the other side. So I'm going to start by putting the burden of proof on those who think that morality is not objective. I want to ask them, what good reason do you have for thinking it's not objective? What solid reason do you have rejecting the objectivity of right and wrong, good and evil, and the rest? Let's see if they can meet that burden. I don't think that they can. I'll give you uh, the main reasons that I know of where people say this sort of thing, and I'll show you why I think that they're in inadequate. If I miss some that you're aware of, I'll be happy to hear about them and try to address them as well. If I can persuade you to at least take seriously the idea that there are no solid objections against objectivity, then I'll try to offer you some considerations in favor of objectivity. That's what I'm going to try to do tonight. So why do people think that morality, right and wrong, good and evil, isn't objective? And by the way, um, outside the insanity of philosoph philosophical classrooms, almost nobody believes this. 
I know what they, they're programmed to say. I know what you have to say to get likes on, on Facebook, but, but nobody believes this. When somebody crosses you or, or, or victimizes you, you have a lot to say. Even you who say there's no state of morality, to call other people victimized and call other people criminals and fascists and then cancel them and so forth and so on. So there's nobody who really, almost nobody who really believes this. But it's a popular position to talk about. It's a talking point. So let's, let's just uh, think about it. One thing that they, that they cite is that there's a tremendous variety of attitudes towards moral rules. Different societies and different times of history have had widely varying moral rules. And because they vary so much, it must be that there's no standard which determines what's right. Whew. That's a big jump, I think. Because there have been lots of different ideas, and because even today there are lots of different ideas, therefore there's no standard of what's right. Couldn't it just be that there's a lot of confusion? Couldn't it just be that our attempts to investigate this subject are primitive? Couldn't it just be that we're waiting, as someone put it, for the Newton of ethics to appear and give us an organized methodology that we could all agree upon? And how, would, how can you go from, we haven't done it yet, to it can't be done because it's impossible? Isn't that a big jump? You know, isn't that sort of unjustified? And then they'll, they'll push it this way. By the way, I'm, I'm, I'm just talking about the logic now. I think the, the statement that there are widely varying moral rules at different times and different places is greatly, greatly exaggerated because of misunderstanding what moral rules are. But I'm not going to go into that for now. I'm just talking about the logic. Then people will say, well, there isn't even an, an agreement on the kind of investigation that should be used to determine this fact. So how to find the moral standard, how to, how to show that it should be accepted, how to agree that we have found the correct moral standard. We don't even agree on how that should be done. Surely that means that there isn't a standard if we can't even agree on what method to use to investigate it. Really? Tell me something. Uh, people have been wondering why the stars shine since there have been people and stars until the 20th century, late 19th century, did anyone have a method by which that could be investigated? Was an agreement on what method should be followed to figure out why the stars shine? Not really. No one was dreaming of nuclear fusion in those days, for the last thousands of years of, history, of human history. But does that mean there's no reality to why the stars shine? Today we think we know the answer, nuclear fusion. I'll give you a worse example. A number of years ago, a noted philosopher wrote a book called Consciousness Explained. In 300 pages, he explained what consciousness is. One of the reviewers in the Journal of Philosophy said a better title for the book would have been Consciousness Ignored, because in 300 pages, he didn't address the subject. <laughs> Man, that's a disagreement. He thinks he's solved it, and this person thinks he's ignored it. Right? <laughs> Do we have an agreed upon method for investing? We don't even agree what the subject is. Does that mean that consciousness isn't real? Or that there's no real nature that consciousness has? That consciousness is beyond understanding? Beyond explanation? No one's taking that position. Psychologists, neurologists, and philosophers are all busy trying to figure out how to explain it, to define it, and to explain it. The mere fact that we don't have an agreed upon method for, for dealing with it is a reason for thinking that it's not objective. In addition, in a wonderful book, there was a, a series years ago called Debates in Philosophy, and um, Objectivity and Morality. It was Gilbert Harmon versus Judith Jarvis Thompson. Um, he was taking the relativist point of view. She was taking the uh, objectivist point of view. And she pointed out something I think is very sharp. She said, when you talk about disagreements in morality, almost all of them regard cases where there are two or more moral considerations in conflict with one another. But if you isolate a moral factor, consider a case where only one moral factor is relevant, then there's very widespread agreement. There isn't disagreement. Let's suppose you make a promise to somebody 
And you have two choices. Keep the promise or break the promise. And either way, nothing else of moral relevance happens. Nobody gets more pleasure or pain. Nobody's property is injured or, prom or promoted. Nobody's freedom is affected. Nothing. There's no difference other than this way the promise is kept and that way the promise is broken. Do we have deep disagreements about what to do here? Do we have puzzlement? What shall we do? There's a misunderstanding of what the question is. Isn't it obvious that the only moral consideration is that this way you'll keep the promise and that way you'll break the promise? You should keep the promise? Or giving pleasure to someone. Or, or, or saving someone's life. Or, by the way, that's why in philosophy they have that bitter uh, challenge called uh, torturing small children for fun. Thank you very much. <coughs> Why do these sadistic philosophers put in torturing small children for fun? The words for fun are supposed to cut off any other, any other moral consideration. That means the only morally relevant factor here is that these children are suffering. Nothing else matters. Well, then of course it's wrong. So she says that what, when you paint ethics as a, as a discipline in which there's hopeless widespread um, disagreement with no progress, you're missing out on a bedrock of agreed upon judgments about which moral features are relevant. Everyone agrees that promises are relevant. Everyone agrees that, that, that life is relevant. Everyone agrees that pleasure is relevant. How relevant and how you trade it off against other things, that's where it gets difficult. So you have a, a sphere in which there's widespread agreement, even another sphere in which there's widespread disagreement. That shouldn't make it sound like it's hopeless to ever find a standard. So the, I think the positive arguments against objectivity don't carry much water. Now, I'm going to repeat what I said 12 minutes ago by pointing out what the next move is of people who attack objectivity. And it's just an illustration of the same fallacy that I pointed out 12 minutes ago. Right? The next thing they say is, well, if you think it's objective, you show me that it's objective. Put your standard on the table and show me that it's got to be right. Meaning, I'm challenging you to put the standard on the table, and if you fail, then I win. And it's really not objective. That's wrong, capital W. If you can't put forward a positive argument against objectivity, then you don't know that objectivity is wrong. You don't get any position free of charge. If the defender of objectivity fails in producing a good reason for objectivity, the disbeliever in objectivity doesn't win, they both lose. But I also should say, we haven't got any good reasons. Since we haven't got any good reasons, there's no reason to make up our minds. We should just confess ignorance. So I, I'm not aware of other arguments that are being used against uh, objectivity. But as I say, if, um, if you here know of people who are listening want to send me emails and, uh, about uh, arguments against objectivity, I'll be happy to hear them and, and, and to address them. I don't know of any good arguments against objectivity. And I should tell you, I have the vast majority of the philosophical community behind me because although they, there's almost nothing they agree on in terms of absolute, uh, substance, but the vast majority of philosophers are thinking about ethics are looking for objective standards. That's what they're looking for. And they're arguing, is this standard appropriate? Is this standard not appropriate? Is it utilitarianism? Is it some deontological uh, position? Are there a combination of the two? They're looking for ways to categorize, organize, um, set out the principles of correct morality. They haven't given up. So uh, I, it, together with the vast majority of human beings who apply moral standards, unhesitatingly you have the majority of philosophical thinkers on the subject who certainly haven't given up on objectivity so um, I, I'm from my own perusal and from that experience I'm quite confident there aren't good reasons to show that objectivity is wrong so now the question is 
what can be said in favor of objectivity? Now, I want to do this in stages. Um, first of all, I want to just break some ground against inertia and, and, and uh, how shall I say, uh, and prejudice. There is this idea that the, the variation in societies and in different times of history is so great um, that um, that it, the idea of having an objective standard is, is hopeless. Now, here you need to know a little bit about the difference between moral principles on the one hand and concrete moral judgments on the other hand. Moral principles are what they say. They're rules that determine certain facts about morality. But a concrete judgment depends upon two different things. It depends upon your moral principles, and it depends upon what you think the relevant facts are. Two people or two societies could agree on all the moral principles and come to wildly different practical decisions because they think the facts are different. I want to give you a few examples uh, of, what, of what this means. I read once in a, in, a, uh, in a book, I don't know if this is true or whether it was just a parable, but supposedly some Eskimo society where when parents reached a certain age, children killed their parents. <clears throat> that sounds very bad. How could children kill their parents? Not only is it murder, but your parents. I mean, Surely, we would have to regard them as moral monsters. Surely, they don't agree with our conceptions of right or wrong, good and evil, if they can kill their parents. But, a little more research was supposed to show that they believe in a soul, and they believe that when you die, that soul goes into an eternal afterlife, and it goes into the eternal afterlife with the mental capacities it has at the moment of death. And they were very aware of mental deterioration as people pass a certain age. And from their point of view, it was an act of supreme kindness to make sure that their parents go into that eternal life as mentally aware and powerful as they could possibly be. Today we call it euthanasia, hey? Mm -hmm. For the aficionados who believe in those sorts of things. So now from regarding it as moral crime, all of a sudden it changes its complexity altogether. It's really motivated by kindness and, and, and love and respect. Our key issue with them, I'm thinking now for the secular moral West, I'm not speaking for the Jewish values now. Our key issue with them would be, why do you believe that there's an afterlife which has the mental acuity that you have at the moment of death? It would be a matter of fact. It wouldn't be their values. Change the facts, and you very often change the moral judgments that you make without changing moral principles, without changing moral rules or values. I'll give you another example. The Nazis. Did they have different moral values from, let's say, those who fought against them, the free world and the rest? No, that comes from the communist era. No, the, the allies as opposed to the Axis. So people say, look at the horrible crimes they committed. Of course they must have had different values from us. But that's a mistake. And I'll prove to you that's a mistake. Because they invented a myth. The myth that Jews are out to take over the world. That Jews control the media. Jews control the banks. That Jews want to uh, 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 install themselves as superior to everyone else, that Jews commit terrible crimes, that Jews are the enemy of mankind. That was the myth that they told. Now, why did they bother doing that? Why did they bother making up that myth? What they should have said is, Jews are nice people, they're clean, they're productive, they're intelligent, they're friendly, and we kill them anyway, because we have different values. You coddle such people, you uh, respect such people, and we kill them. It's just, you know, your values and our values. Why do they have to make up the myth? Because when you make up the myth that the Jews are evil and dangerous, 
You could then enlist all the old values. Killing them is self-protection. Killing them is defense. Everybody has a right to self-protection and defense. You make up the myth in order to use the old values to get the outcome that you want. That means it's not a change of values. The American colonists from the British, or European colonists who colonized North America did a similar thing. They were the indigenous peoples, that's the latest code word, um, who lived on the land and, and, were, you know, and had their tribes and their social organization and their lifestyle. And the white invaders had what's called manifest destiny. From sea to shining sea, you know, we shall rule North America. Well, that meant taking the land away from the indigenous peoples. But how could you do that? How can you take land away from people? Isn't that stealing? No, see, because if you have a red skin, you're not human. <laughs> Solves the problem. You have a, a, a red skin, you're not human. So I'm not taking land away from people. They're not people. Why did they make up that story? Because you can't take land from people. You can't do that. That's wrong. They shared that value with everybody else. So you get around it by saying they're not people. It's not so easy to show that there really are different values because when you look at a culture and you look at what they do in the culture, that, those actions are embedded in a whole thought system, in a whole picture of reality, including human reality. So that being the case, to tease out what the moral principles are from the rest of the culture is not an easy job. You know, the, in the pyramids you have weapons, you have food, Sometimes you have little boats that are, that are buried with this guy. Right? Why were they doing that? To drive up prices by creating scarcity? I mean, what was the point in doing that? The answer is they thought he was going to live again. And we, you know he's going to have to cross a river, so he needs a boat. He needs food to eat. He needs weapons so he can fight with his enemies. This is providing for a person's life. That's what it is. Oh. So when you know those beliefs, your attitude towards what they're doing is very different. So uh, the argument that, that moral values are so various, uh, you know, this was, I grew up in the Margaret Mead era when uh, this was trumpeted for political reasons. And then the 80s and 90s, the pendulum swung the other way. A fellow named Williams, who, who on four pages, two columns, single-spaced, listed uh, universals in every uh, society, human society that had been studied. And I saw it in a book by Steven Pinker, who's not the world's most incisive thinker. Um, so from going from everything's relative to a vast number of, uh, of universals, including the basics of, of morality. Um, so it's just simply, simply not correct to say that, the, that the, the variety is so great. Now... That, strictly speaking, doesn't prove my point, because even if everybody agrees down to the last detail, they could all be wrong. If morality is objective, agreement doesn't close it. Once upon a time, I think almost everyone, if not everyone on the planet, agreed on three basic principles. One is that the Earth is flat, and number two, that the Earth is the center of the universe, and number three, that the Earth is motionless. All three are dead wrong at least according to contemporary lights. So it's not that agreement makes it right. But if you're unnerved by the variety, if the variety is what's making it palatable for you to think that there are no objective standards, I think you have to think again because variety isn't nearly what you think it is. So we greatly exaggerate it again for political purposes. And now I want, yeah. Is that not to say that some groups can have different moral values? Because I know that, for example, in the 80s, 90s, there was this whole idea that greed is good um, and that we should be selfishly just trying to improve ourselves and so on and kind of altruism or being in some kind of collective 
is is in some way, shape, or form bad. So would that be a difference in the facts or a difference in the principles? Okay, so here's a good example. You're you're asking whether uh, the position I'm taking would allow different groups to have different values. An example that you give was the, uh, what's in it for number one? I think that's one of their slogans. You know, the, uh, the me first uh, uh, philosophy, that uh, promoting yourself is, is the best thing to do, and uh, collective responsibility is something which is, which is bad in some way. Right? Uh, would that not be an example of having a different, a different value system? I think one way to test this is to ask. Um, you have one person who says, put yourself first and make sure that you're getting the top payoff, and that's the best. Another person who says, social responsibility and compassion and sharing and sacrifice are the best. I would ask each one, why do you think what you do? Why do you think that this is best? Why do you think that's best? And see kind of, kind of answers they give you. Typically, the answers will be, well, this way produces more happiness. Mm -hmm. Oh, produces more happiness. The assumption in the discussion is everybody thinks happiness is important. You're proposing a way of living because you think that will produce happiness. Well, you're making a big mistake. It doesn't really produce happiness. It produces a lot of misery. <laughs> and this way it produces more happiness. <laughs> They don't disagree with their values. They both value happiness. Mm -hmm. They disagree about how to get to happiness. It's sort of like disagreements in, in economics. They all want a bigger GDP. Right? <laughs> they, all want, they all want a higher standard of living. They disagree what kind of measures to take to produce it, economically speaking. So you, very often when you ask for the reasons you get a snapshot of what their thinking is and what their, and what their principles are. And I think that's, 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 one, that's one way to, to, to test it. And now, <coughs> I'm, I'm going to use an argument. Up to now, I think whatever I've said is, is pablum. I think it's, you know, it's, it's agreed upon, and I think it's not, not controversial. What I'll tell you now is very controversial. Uh, the only recommendation I have for what I'm saying is that I'm right, <laughs> and everybody else is wrong. Um, and let's start with it this way. Let's take a person who says that different societies have different conceptions of basic moral ideas. Justice. What is just? Different societies and different times have different concepts of justice. They have different concepts of goodness, different concepts of obligation. And that being the case, they can't be a single moral standard because they're different moral standards. Um, years ago, I was talking about truth, which is also a, a value term. And I said that there are Eastern religious texts which have in the many statements that aren't true. And one of the students said, you mean they aren't Western true? See, they aren't Western true. But they're Eastern true. You have your concept of truth, they have their concept of truth. Why should they live up to your concept of truth? That's apples and oranges, you know? They're not preaching to you. They're expressing the, the foundation of their own culture. So the same thing could be said about good and evil, justice, and right and wrong. This is... 20, 21st century Western right and wrong and justice. It's not Indonesian justice. It's not ancient Greek justice. They differ from one another. I think there's a serious problem here. I think there's a serious problem here. Now, I'm using the argumentation that was made popular by a very famous 20th century philosopher, William, uh, William Van Elmer Quine. But he didn't use it in this connection, so I'm, I'm disavowing his support for my application of it, though the idea, the basic idea is his. How far is it credible to go in saying that other cultures differ from us in basic ideas? How far is it credible to go? There was a French-Jewish 
so, uh, anthropologist named Claude Levi Strauss. He claimed to have discovered pre logical peoples, peoples with no sense of logic. He claimed that these people could say, honestly and sincerely, it is raining here and now, and it is not raining here and now. They could say that and believe it and be satisfied with it and, and uh, accept it. Of course, to us, that's just gobbledygook. That's absolute nonsense. But he claimed that, of course, they're very primitive, but they, could, that they did that sort of thing. They, they thought of that sort of thing. They believed that sort of thing. He was criticized roundly. Quine's way of putting the criticism is this. How do you know that's what they believe? Let's make this vivid. Let's suppose that you're an anthropologist, you're visiting them, and at the outset, you don't speak their language. You're visiting a foreign culture altogether. How do you know what they believe? Well, you live with them for a long time, and you listen to them jabbering away, making the sounds that they make, and you look at the circumstances that they're in, and you write, you write a dictionary. Well, a dictionary is a theory. It's a hypothesis. Maybe this means this, maybe that means that. Could get it wrong. Could be required to revise it from time to time. I am told that the early English explorers who went to Australia, and they were observing the natives, and one of those two-legged pouched creatures went hopping by, they would say, kangaroo, kangaroo. So they put down in their budding dictionary, kang the word kangaroo in, in Australian means these two-legged pouch creatures, but it didn't. Kangaroo meant, there it goes! <laughs> it didn't mean the animal. It meant, there it goes, because it was always going. It was going by, fast. So they would say, kangaroo. They just got it wrong. So now, you're, there's an anthropologist. You're observing these people. They're jabbering away. You're keeping track, and you're building what you think is a dictionary of what they say, and now, one day, you hear them say, uh, gobbledy, 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 goo, and you take out your dictionary, gobbledy, 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 <laughs> and, and you say, ah, I got it. They said, it is raining here and now, and it is rain not raining here and now. <laughs> really? Maybe that should cause you to question the dictionary. Maybe that shows you the dictionary's got it wrong. Because, you know, if they believe something like that, they're not going to make it through the next hour. You know, they're fighting a battle. They're shooting arrows at the enemy from the wall. They're running out of arrows. So the guy on the, uh, on the wall says to, to his, his, his soldier down below, bring me more arrows. Two minutes later, the guy comes back with a cup of hot chocolate. Does he notice the difference? Does he ask somebody else next time? Rather than asking this, do you drink the coffee, the chocolate, and say thank you very much, have a nice day? How do you function if you can't think your way out of it is raining here and now, and it is not raining here and now. There's no way you can function if you think things like that. Then what you ought to say is that the dictionary is wrong. There's a certain limit on the kind of difference of opinion that you can tolerate on the grounds that this is something some people call it the principle of charity. These are human beings. They have a society. They have a social life. They have a cooperative economy. They fight battles with other people. They're doing okay. If your mind was confused like that, you couldn't be doing okay. So if your dictionary says that that's what they believe, you must be wrong. Here they go. They say what they say. Gobbledy, 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 gook. I look up at my, my dictionary and say, ah, two plus two is five. Ah, see, I've discovered people who don't understand basic arithmetic. They think two plus two is five. Really? Really? How do they trade? How do they get enough... Uh, meals for dinner. How, how, how do they? How do they? You know, count the days till, till the bar mitzvah for coming up. I mean, I, I, if they think two plus two is five, they're crippled. They're lost. They're going to be dead in a day, and they're not dead. They're functioning. Well, if your dictionary says they believe two plus two is five, there's something wrong with your dictionary. When the dictionary delivers something they're supposed to believe, which is obviously wrong. Then, then that impugns the dictionary. 
Here we go again. Gobbly, 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 gook. And I look at my thing and it says, there are no trees. Huh? There are no trees. These people don't believe in trees. They're living in a forest, but they don't believe there are trees. Well, they're primitive. Right. <laughs> really? They're primitive? They don't believe that there are trees when they're living among trees? Something has to be wrong, doesn't it? I mean, by the way, when you have a discussion with someone, when, there are times when you say to the person, well, what do you mean by this? What prompts you to say that? What prompts that, that question? What prompts that question is, you're talking about something, he says something, and you think, boy, if he means by those words what I mean by those words, what he's saying is obviously wrong. He's not stupid. He's serious about the discussion. It can't be we mean the same thing by the words, because otherwise he couldn't say that. So you ask him, what do you mean? And that's the right thing to do. And it works, because he says, oh, I mean this and this and this. He says, oh, wow, I'm glad you told me, because I don't mean this and this by, by those words. I think this is, this is you know, like this bottom line. My, my uh, humorous example is you go to China and you observe them in the following competition. They, this is a competition they, they do on horseback. In a shallow stream, there's a lead ball weighing five pounds, which is a, on the bed of the stream, and they have poles. And the idea is to push the pole into the other guy's territory. And there are five guys on this side, five guys on that side, well, on horseback, and then half the time, this one's going upstream and this one's going downstream, and then the other half the time, they switch, and how many yards you push it into the other guy's territory is what makes you win. Okay, that's the, the Chinese game. And then they tell you, by the way, our name for this game is chess. This is Chinese chess. Look, you have Western chess. This is Eastern chess. No, it isn't Eastern chess. Not chess at all. I mean, you can use any sounds you want, but it has no relationship whatsoever to the English word C-H-E-S-S -S because it is not chess. If you told me that they play chess without castling, we allow castling, they don't allow castling, okay. It could be a different form of chess. But it's sort, of, sort of like saying rugby is European baseball. <laughs> No, it isn't. It's not baseball at all. It's, it's just it's a different game. It might be European football. It might be baseball. So now, if, with this general idea in mind, that there are limits to how, how much difference you're going to tolerate, even between different cultures, because if you describe them in their culture as holding a certain position, the position is so obvious, it doesn't give them the credit for the intelligence and, and, and abilities that they have. Let's try to apply that to morality. Let's try to take certain statements where someone would say, well, in that society, this is what's moral. And see whether we can't apply the same test. Let's take the one I mentioned before. In, Westerns, in Western society, Western culture, Western morals, Torturing small, fun, small children for fun is forbidden. In their society, torturing small children for fun is permissible. Morally permissible. They mean by moral what we mean by moral. Forbidden and permissible are both words that we have in both cultures, and we just disagree. I think at that point, what we should say is, no, it isn't. <laughs> it's not morally permissible. This is an obvious case. This is the 2 plus 2 equals 4 of morality. And if your dictionary for their words delivers for you torturing small children for fun is morally permissible, your dictionary is wrong. In particular, morally permissible is not the right translation of the term that they're using to describe that judgment. For fun. I'll give you another, another example. Suppose they tell you you know, gobbly, 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 gook. Justice is exactly what the chief says and nothing else counts. No, it isn't. <laughs> no, it isn't. That's not what justice is. That's obviously wrong. And if your dictionary delivers that statement about them, the dictionary is incorrect. Now, people are going to say, you're just imperialistically imposing your values on other societies. My answer to that is, no, I'm not. Remember, 
What's the project here? The project here is to describe that culture in English. That's the project. English is my language. We're looking for the correct description of them in my language. In particular, we're looking for an English description of what they believe. An English description of what they value. And it is an English description of their moral concepts. But value, believe, and moral, and concepts are my words. You're describing them in my words. Well then, the description has to make sense in my words. That's the project. If you don't want to describe them in my words, then go have a cup of tea and leave me alone. Why are we talking about it? You want me to learn their language and talk to them in their language? Why? Why should I do that? I'm trying to figure out my world on the basis of my language. You were telling me what I have to say in English about them. Oh, yeah? Well, let's discuss that in English and see whether that makes sense. If you're going to put me in a position where I, in English, have to describe what they believe and attribute to them a belief that's nuts, I reject that because they're not nuts. They're not nuts. So just like Levi Strauss was dead wrong in saying they're pre-logical peoples, so it's dead wrong to say that there are people who think that torturing small children for fun is morally permissible in our sense of morally permissible. That's just not correct. They may mean that it's pleasing to the chief. They may mean that it's... Um, uh, they may mean that uh, no one's going to stop you and no one will hate you, a social remark or a psychological remark. They may not have our concept of morality at all. And in the spirit of egalitarianism, which I don't believe, uh, I could say, maybe so much the better for them. Who says they have to have our concept of morality? But that means they have zero morality, not a different morality. Because when it differs too much, it's not called morality anymore. You're telling me what to say in English. You're saying, I'm supposed to say they have a different morality. Well, you're asking me to apply my word morality to what they're doing. Well, my word has limits. My word has limits. So I think that any place where the suggestion that they have a different morality is going to run up against this principle of charity, it's, it's, uh, there's good reason to reject it. The, war, the sky is not open to just any old thought as to what morality might be. Morality, that word in English. Now, are there differences? Yeah, sure there are, between Harvard and, 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 and MIT, both in, Mass, in, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, there are differences. But the, the differences are like the differences between playing chess with castling and playing chess without castling. There are minor variations, and there are, they are dis uh, uh, discussed and debated 100%. But then there are also limits. Where exactly the limits are? Hard question. Most concepts have black, white, and gray areas, and the gray areas are difficult. And there isn't always agreement on where exactly the boundary lines are. But there is some black, and there is some white, and there is some gray. And that's something which everybody who has the concept agrees upon. You have a question? Yeah. yeah. How should we view the immorality of idolaters and pagans in the Bible? Were they unaware of the moral facts, but they had the same values? Were they just wrong? Or did they know the morality, but just ignored it? So uh, the question you're asking really is a psychological question. Um, and I, I'm not trained in psychology. Um, I don't know what the status of these uh, uh, primitive, uh, these other societies, or all ancient societies, I shouldn't say primitive, uh, ancient societies is. By the way, uh, let me make one more other remark and then I'll, I'll go back to your question. Uh, if you see individual people or a group of people who flagrantly perform actions that we call immoral, that may have no relevance at all. They're just doing the wrong thing. And they may indeed know that it's a wrong thing. We're not talking about living up to your moral principles perfectly. That's not the subject. The question is what your moral principles are. You know, there are things which in the Jewish community, every year in Yom Kippur, the vast majority of people clap, or hate, they say, I've sinned, I've sinned, I've sinned in certain areas. That doesn't mean 
because they go back to sinning the next, uh, next month and they clap every, every year that they don't really believe in the value. It means they're weak and they're making the wrong decisions. So you can't read it from their actions. <clears throat> yeah, that's why I kept talking about what they believe. I talked about translating what they say. Um, now, um, there's a big difference between disagreement about a matter and failing to have the matter arise because of a different conceptual scheme. The same people who, who discovered pre-logical peoples claim to have discovered pre-arithmetic um, pre peoples. I don't know, again, it was just a gigantic mistake. But the, the, the report we get is that these people count one, two, three, many, and that's it. <laughs> there aren't enough numbers to do arithmetic, you know. The addition and subtraction never appear, let alone all the other functions. Um, so now, we say two plus two is four. What do they say? They say, have a nice day, and get a tea, and other things like that. They don't say two plus two is five. They don't disagree with us. They haven't got the concepts to enter into the discussion. That's certainly possible. Well, certainly. It, it's conceivable, let's put it that way. It's certainly conceivable. And I suppose it's conceivable to have a culture where our moral concepts just don't figure at all. They're just not there. So then, it's still appropriate for us to say that injustice is going on, oppression is going on, victimization is going on, but it doesn't carry many of the, of the consequences that it would if we were talking about a society that had the concepts then the people would know that it's wrong and they'd be premeditatedly doing evil. They would create justifications for it and they would be either true or false or reasonable or unreasonable. We'd have a whole network of consequences if they had the concepts, which would be very different from the position when they don't have the concepts. So, <coughs> um, and to use the word victimization, for example, would have to be understood in limited fashion. And you know, when a lion catches, kills a gazelle, and eats it. Is that cruelty? Not really. It's not cruelty. It's just his natural programmed behavior, and, and, and he survives that way. So, but it's certainly not just, certainly not good, certainly not right, certainly not, you know, certainly not no positive moral qualities, um, because there's no moral concepts there at all. And if you find cooperative behavior among animals, which they claim to have, although the claims are, should be always suspect because they read things in, um, this is just what they're programmed to do. It certainly has no moral content. It's just, that's what they're, that's what they're programmed to do. So, um, I, I think that in this way you could, you could set at least some limits uh, to how much variation there could be in human morality. And that being the case, when a person's going to be limited by that, that uh, those limits, and uh, there'll be certain norms that are required because to violate the norm is just, just a step outside the realm of morality altogether. Once you have any objective standard at all, at any level, even if it covers 10% of the cases, you've changed the ball field. You've changed, you've changed the playing game playing field, because now objectivity isn't ruled out, not irrelevant, it's not, on the contrary, objectivity applies, and it applies at least here, then the, the field is open to discuss other elements which could produce objective, uh, objective uh, judgments. Questions? So I'll, I'll just make one more remark. Um, when philosophers discuss various moral theories, they use judgments as reasons for and against. And I think when you hear them, the judgments seem to be really very solid. Um, utilitarianism is a widespread failed theory, grossly failed theory, for at least a dozen reasons, in spite of Peter Singer. Um, I'll take an example like this. Totalitarianism means roughly 
act in such a way as to maximize benefit for the, for the totality of people, pleasure, happiness, desire, satisfaction, or some other feature. Now you got 10 people stranded on a desert island, and the fact is they're going to live there and die there, and no one's ever going to discover them. So their actions affect only themselves until they all die. And let's imagine that nine of them would get considerable pleasure out of torturing the 10th. And there's no other way that they could get comparable pleasure. According to utilitarianism, hang, I'm glad you're sitting down. According to utilitarianism, they're obligated to torture him. They must torture him. Not that they have permission, because you must do that which produces the maximum pleasure, happiness, whatever your, whatever your particular value is. So they're obligated. Isn't that grossly out of whack? Isn't that nuts? They're obligated to torture? They can't even refrain out of decency? Something's got to be wrong with the theory that says that. Along with a dozen other things that it says. So now, what's going on here? Somebody says, yeah, but in my culture, it is right to torture them. Really? No, it isn't. <laughs> no, in, in my culture, it is ob obligatory to, to, to torture. No, it isn't. It can't be obligatory. It's just obligation doesn't work that way. So I think that, that the, this can be said. I think that the casual, ignoramus, ignoramic dismissal of objective morality is, um, is, is totally irresponsible. And by the way, I will finish with this. You know, I taught the university for 10 years, and that was a long time ago, because I'm very old. I do remember a, a, a famous contradiction at the heart of a lot of undergraduate thinking, and that was, number one, morality is relative, so don't tell me what's right and wrong. I have my own morality. And number two, if the faculty or the administration were victimizing the students in a certain way, then they claim you're trampling on my rights. What you're doing is vicious and evil. Oh, yeah? Both of them? At the same time? That morality is relative and they're trampling on your rights and vicious and evil? Uh, those two don't go together too well, logically, because if it's relative, they just simply say, we don't recognize those rights. End of story. No, but what are the students saying? Here's what the students saying. They're saying, Get off my back. Leave me alone. I'll do as I please. So don't tell me there are standards of morality that bind me. I'll do as I please. There are no standards of morality. And don't get in my way physically. Don't take away my resources because then you're trampling on my rights. Get off my back and let me do what I please. Both of them have the same goal in, in, in you know, fighting with daddy and fighting with the local parentis of the university authorities. Get off my back and leave me alone. I, there's a contradiction in the two principles. Who cares? Just get off my back and leave me alone. I think that's, that's the way it operates for, for many people, uh, that they want the interpersonal impact of the statement to get them something they want, and that they, whichever statement works at the, at the moment, and whether they're consistent or not, is really of little interest to them. We tried to educate them to do better than that. It was pretty much a failure. <laughs>